So we are delighted to have with us uh, here at uh, Universidad Camilo José Cela, Professor John Drew, who is a professor of English literature and Dean of Humanities at the University of Buckingham in the UK. Uh, so Professor Drew, uh, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to be with you. You've uh, done a lot of research and a lot of work on uh, Charles Dickens and his relationship with journalism. Uh, maybe we can start uh, by asking you how you became interested in this aspect of uh, Dickens' uh, career and work in the first place. Well, um, if it's all right to give an answer that's fairly uh, personal to me, mm -hmm. um, I think I'd, I'd been out of uh, university a couple of years um, when I felt that I'd forgotten virtually everything that I'd learned mm -hmm. as an undergraduate. Um, and uh, something in me was, was I, I discovered a, a, a hunger that perhaps wasn't there while I was an undergraduate um, mm -hmm. to know more and to, to study more. And so uh, a doctoral program of, of sort of three years minimum uh, was what I was looking at. And pragmatically, um, and perhaps rather lazily, or I don't know, I, I thought I would choose a, a, a writer who regularly made me laugh um, because I thought if I was going to go down that, that, that route of hard research on my own, um, then I'd, I'd better choose an, uh, an author that I knew would be diverting. Um, so Dickens was the choice, and I remember going into Blackwell's bookshop in Oxford and looking at the publications of secondary materials on, on, on Dickens, and I could see pretty much that all bases were covered as far as his novels were concerned. I did pick up that there was one um, department in particular, Birkbeck College, which is part of London University, um, was very expert in, in Dickens scholars. But I could also see that there was not much attention being paid to his uh, non-fiction. And I knew that this existed, but it was a, an unknown field to me. And that's what I, I, I wrote a proposal and uh, they took me on. Right. Um, yeah, this is, this is interesting as I was kind of thinking about uh, Dickens and the relationship between literature and journalism, I guess one of the things that's most characteristic about his style is that he creates these comically grotesque characters. And he does so to make a moral point, right? So you don't want to be a miser because you don't want to be like Scrooge or you don't want to be uh, absurdly factual because you don't want to be uh, like Rag Rind uh, from Bleak House, etc. And it strikes me that this seems like something that a novelist could do but something that maybe a journalist would kind of um, uh, not be so comfortable with, this idea of uh, creating this deformed vision of reality in order to make a commentary on that reality. Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that idea, that maybe he's uh, doing something that a novelist is okay to do, but maybe not so much a journalist. Well, certainly there's the kind of uh, journalistic ethics um, that has become part and parcel of training journalists in the 20th century. But I think those ethics um, were articulated um, perhaps after the First World War. Um, I think that journalists in the 19th century were quite tribal um, and they were quite uh, factional and quite sectarian and you supported your publication. And if your publication had a patron, um, that was the line you followed. So I'm not sure that this idea of um, journalistic objectivity um, was quite um, so strong when Dickens was um, a young man just cutting his teeth in the profession. But what I think what I would add is that even in his novels, when he wants to create a moral point, um, not all of his grotesques uh, carry a kind of allegory. Okay. Um, I think that um, he has created such a teeming world um, of what from normative 20th century standards, 21st century standards, might be regarded as oddities and eccentrics. Of that cast of hundreds, um, only some will perhaps be capable of carrying a a moral point like a Scrooge or, a, a, you know, an arch hypocrite like Mr. Pecksniff in the novel Martin Chuzzlewit or, you know, one, one, the list could, could go on. But the reader has to pick them out from amongst grotesques that 
simply perhaps carry no meaning. Um, and that, that process is, is perhaps more critically advanced than some of Dickens's uh, detractors have claimed. Sure, that, well, that's really interesting. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, I guess one of the things that's fascinating about, about Dickens is, um, well, first, how immensely popular he was mm -hmm. in his time, mm -hmm. uh, and that he exemplifies an, a moment in which the novel is the form of mass entertainment. It doesn't have a real competitor. Um, yeah. and, Absolutely. Yes. And also this element of serialized uh, fiction, uh, of this fiction that is published in, in installments. And it seems to me that if we transplanted that to today, maybe the closest parallel wouldn't really be today's novel, but maybe today's TV shows. Right? So <laughs> I'm wondering if maybe just uh, maybe as a provocative suggestion, if maybe uh, we could consider that maybe the Charles Dickens of our time isn't someone like Jonathan Franzen or Paul Auster, what we would consider the great novelists of today, where maybe it would be somebody like David Simon, like a cre the creator of The Wire or the person behind The Sopranos. So somebody who is behind these incredibly popular forms of, uh, of fiction that are now consumed audiovisually instead of in, in writing. Yes, I think that's um, that's accurate, um, although it's speculative. Um, sure. And Dickens was fascinated by, um, not to put too fine a point in it, the power um, that being at the helm of a mixed media production like a serial novel with its illustrations and all its spin-offs um, could, um, could confer him. Um, so I think, yes, he would have been like Orson Welles, um, fascinated with uh, film as, you know, a wonderful train set, mm. um, as Welles describes it at, at one point when he was taken on by RKO. Um, and I think he would have been fascinated also by the idea of either, um, you know, a Peter Jackson style trilogy um, coming out just before Christmas over a three year period and that kind of hold over an audience's imagination um, that the Lord of the Rings uh, trilogy had. Um, and he'd also, I think, uh, yes, been fascinated um, by the soap opera format, um, which does seem to proceed on kind of Victorian principles. There's the um, phrase attributed to a, a contemporary of Dickens's called uh, Charles Reed, um, who said that he worked by the formula, make them laugh, make them cry, make them wait. <laughs> um, so that kind of philosophy, you know, Dickens was a master um, at the, the laughing and the crying and the, <laughs> and the waiting. Um, and that I think has, um, but I think it's an aftershock of Dickens, um, the, the, the way that um, that film and, and, and TV series have, have developed. Sure. I think they would have been different had he not existed. Right. So in a way, this this sense of the, the hunger for the next installment is a kind of cultural um, sort of creation that uh, the Victorian novel participated in and then it was inherited in the in the 20th century, maybe we can think about it in that. In yes, that and I, th I think some of the, um, the, the, the repetitions, I mean, it, often it's done in a very bold and uninventive way um, with series when they begin with a kind of rapid resume of what's happened in the last episode, a kind of montage. You know, this is what happened last time. Um, Previously on. House yeah, of yeah. Times, but Dickens is, I, I think, subtler than, than, than that. Um, in that he gives uh, one of the things that makes readers um, of his novels in, in the, the sort of single volume format say that he's repetitive and uses exaggerated traits um, is that he's thinking that he's got to give um, if he's got maybe 50 or 100 named characters in a story he's got to give them catchphrases so that people can remember who they are Right. Um, which is why, you know, somebody like like um, Mr. Micawber is always waiting for something to turn up. Um, right. And, you know, dozens of these characters have got their little tricks of speech. And it's a, it's a way of them um, remaining in the reader's mind for a month so that when the next um, entrega of the serial comes out, the next instalment, um, they immediately are 
sorted by the reader into the right place. Oh, yes, I know who this person is. Yeah, that, that awareness of the reader is remarkable. I mean, I think we think of our age as unique in terms of how we are obsessed with, uh, you know, content generators on the web are obsessed mm -hmm. with responding to uh, readers' uh, process and what they're, how the readers experience, right? And you'll modify your web page depending on what, uh, what people are clicking on and all that stuff. But evidently, uh, Dickens himself was very aware of the feedback that he was getting from readers to each installment and yeah. modifying sometimes even plots accordingly, right? If I'm, if I'm not You're mistaken. You're not mistaken. There are some wonderful examples of, uh, of this that also trespass on to the, the kind of legal side, side of things. Um, one of his big monthly serials, David Copperfield, um, introduced in an early episode, and it, it had uh, 20 episodes over 20 months. Um, so early in, in the first six months, he introduced a, a, a wicked character who was um, a, a London dwarf female who could tell the future. And her name was Miss Moucher. Um, and the person on whom he had based Miss Moucher got in touch through her lawyers and said, this isn't looking good. <laughs> and he replied again through the lawyers, don't worry, we'll sort it out. And lo and behold, by the final six months of David Copperfield, Miss Moucher has come onto the side of the good guys um, and is helping things out. And uh, to the extent that you can be an attractive character if you're a clairvoyant dwarf, um, she was, she was um, as it were, resuscitated and made good. Right. Maybe he should have uh, invented, uh, you know, all characters are fictional <laughs> and uh, any likeness to real yeah. life is a coincidence. But he was a terrible one for doing this in a kind of insouciant way, like, who, me? Um, it, it, he just seemed to regard it as the artist's prerogative to pick out traits from people that he knew well um, and put them into characters who, in plot terms, are doing things quite, un, you know, quite unpleasant um, and congratulating himself on how close to reality he was making them. And then when they complained to him, he would say, come on, it's just a story. Yeah, I think <laughs> Philip Roth says something that yeah. uh, the, wor the worst thing that somebody can do is confess something to a writer who's currently writing. Uh, um, if I may, uh, you probably get this a lot, but as a last question, what would you say is your favorite uh, work by Charles Dickens? Um, this is a difficult one. I, um, I sometimes have what I think is, is, is called fiction fatigue. Um, and uh, my reading time um, as a sort of midlife uh, professional person is, is, is circumscribed. So I tend to prefer his articles and his, his nonfiction just because I can keep the book by the bedside um, and read a, an essay before I fall off to sleep. And I don't have to follow the, follow the long thread. Um, that said, we've been running um, from the Buckingham um, archive of Dickens's work these read-alongs um, for the past five or six years, um, and I'm finding that I, because I join in and because I blog about each instalment as it comes out, and that I'm getting back into some of those works. And at the moment, we're doing Great Expectations, um, so it's fresh in my mind, and it, it, it's superb. Well, it's it's a wonderful work, and uh, it is very interesting to know the, these initiatives that uh, you're developing of uh, adapting, in a way, adapting Dickens to the digital age, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time as a way to recover the essence of what it was like to read Dickens in Victorian times. That's right, because we've got an, a, you know, a great archive of press reviews of his work when it came out in the 19th century, but we don't know. We can only suppose what common readers, ordinary readers, thought. Um, and this is a way of sort of recuperating for perhaps generations in a hundred years' time, um, assuming we're still interested in, in literature, which I hope we will be, um, recuperating for those scholars and, and readers what a early 21st century audience, mixed general audience, um, academics, but anybody with a web connection who's following the series, um, made of, of the work of this great writer. Right. Well, thank you very much, Professor John Drew, for being here. And uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to hear you talk about your work and about Charles Dickens. David, thank you very much. It was a pleasure.